problem with my mic, apparently. They can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Have I Got News For You. I'm Alexander Armstrong. In the news this week, after the disastrous speech by Theresa May, conference organisers admit they failed to run checks on exactly who was making the scenery. <laughs> <laughs> At a school in Battersea, after he comes second in the egg and spoon race, classmates are forced to take action as Prince George throws another tantrum. <laughs> And in Manchester, after a disastrous speech, CCTV shows Theresa May leaving the conference centre relieved that the worst is behind her. <laughs> <laughs> On Ian's team tonight is a comedian who claims that if she ever met a lion, she could make it her friend, which is why we are delighted to have booked her before her open-air gig next week at Longleat. Please welcome <laughs> Roisin Connerty! <laughs> Paul tonight is a radio phone-in host who debates controversial topics with angry, opinionated callers. So his show is sort of what Twitter would sound like. <laughs> Please welcome James O'Brien. <laughs> and we start with the biggest stories of the week. Ian and Roisin, take a look at this. Oh, there's the former Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> Depends when you're watching. God, I hope that's not the next one. Someone's coughing. <laughs> yeah, there Sorry. she is, handing out sweets. Ah, <laughs> uh, there's the Tory housing policy. <laughs> so much happened. Yeah, no, it's extraordinary. I mean, I thought it'd be terribly boring, like most conference speeches, but it was just fabulous. Um, <laughs> and I know a lot of people who are probably nicer than me felt very sorry for her. But I thought it was very, very funny. <laughs> It's a bad sign when a cough suite goes down better than you do. <laughs> hey. well, should, we just, should we just remind ourselves of, of what it looked like? Let's yeah. just... Some <clears throat> viewers may find this scene excruciating. Um, <laughs> Ten years after Northern Rock... <coughs> <coughs> and we... <coughs> <coughs> ...dealing with our debts... <coughs> 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 in training for doctors and nurses. <laughs> <coughs> and we, <clears throat> we've created record numbers of jobs. Why we will never... She coughed so much, it felt like she was going to start coughing insects. <laughs> like, like an actual horror film. But it's that moment when you're talking to someone who doesn't really believe what they're saying, and they're saying, yes, I'm, uh, I'm really the person for the job. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> and uh, everything's going very... <coughs> <laughs> Coughing does not do well for female politicians. Her and Hillary Clinton, yeah. their colds have destroyed them. <laughs> well, Ian Duncan Smith used to cough a lot. Mm. Do you remember? He was another successful Tory leader. <laughs> uh... he, he, he never had it that bad, though. No, you don't think so? Just, no, it was a sort of much lower level cough-based problem. Theresa <laughs> May took it to... I mean, she weaponised. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite incredible. I, felt, I can't believe you didn't feel any sympathy for her at all. Not even a scintilla. Um... Oh, dear. I did. <laughs> I think I'm coming across as a bad it person. Was awful. I only felt so far because of Boris. I feel that she's... That, that was such a bad day that it was almost a win for Boris, and I feel that's the only... Like, so I feel like I hate him so much that you want her to have a better gig, you know? The, 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 Why did she sack Boris? She can't. Oh. She can't, can she, sack Boris? Why? Well, because if, if she sacks him, he gets to walk away from Brexit while simultaneously being able to claim that if he'd stayed in the government, it all would have gone much better than it's clearly yeah. going to go. You know, she can't allow him the pleasure. It's like, you know, he's essentially an arsonist who wants to come back dressed as a fireman. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
Um, where's the fire? <laughs> 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 There was one of her services, she's been accused of being robotic, so one of the uh, conservative backbenchers today was making the rounds of the TV studio saying she's made of very strong metal, which I thought was... <laughs> 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 was there an upside, though, to the coughing? No. She got a sweet. <laughs> she, got, she, got, she got lots of ovations, didn't she? Mm. A lot of applause. Well, I think the, the Cabinet, particularly Amber Rudd, decided that to give her more time, they would get to their feet. Mm. But she didn't tell Boris. Mm. <laughs> I do, I do hope you've got this bit of footage. We have got this bit of footage. Let's yeah. have a look at this. Let this party celebrate the wealth creators, <laughs> the risk takers, the innovators and entrepreneurs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there was a very good debate at the conference of people saying what did Amber Rudd say to get him yeah. to his feet? And yeah. someone said it was quick, my husband. <laughs> 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 I mean, he's not even backstabbing her, he's stabbing her in the front. <laughs> <laughs> Just sack him. Oh, <laughs> don't give him what he wants. That's, that's the that's the poison. It's a rock and a hard place. He, he, he doesn't you know, behave in any way that deserves to stay. But she needs to show power. She but she can't power. show power because she hasn't got any. No. <laughs> you weren't moved by let the lion roar. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a quote from Churchill, and he's always trying to be Churchill. Mm. The dog in the air. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> do you want to be leader? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Will you do anything? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Quentin, let's spot it another upside. What was, what was that? Is it that because she managed to get to the end of her speech, then, to use his word, um, negotiating the toughest thing that the country's undertaken since the Second World War would be a cinch? A cinch. A cinch. No, it wasn't. No, oh. he said, <laughs> he said for, for possibly the first time in her political career, Mrs May was not boring. <laughs> What was the what was the other thing during the speech? Obviously, that, that helped unite the crowd behind her. The uh, practical joke, the P forty five. The prankster. Mm. The is prankster. Anything more depressing than a prankster? <laughs> uh, here, here, here it is. And it's the Conservative Party that has a vision of an open, global, self confident Britain. While our opponents work for the foreign policy of neutrality and prepare for a run on the. Bank. What I did like about her, it's something very English when you still take the leaflet, even though you're quite busy. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, well, well, OK, thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The incident raised all sorts of questions around security, obviously. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you know, how could someone under 60 not arouse suspicion? <laughs> 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 After days of poorly delivered jokes from almost all the speakers, finally there was some fantastic comic timing. Was it the handing of the lozenge? No, it was the fridge magnet falling off oh, the yeah. slogan behind. Let's, uh, let's just have a little look at that. ..of modern Britain, in all its diversity, compassion and strength, that was shared... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, those letters had been up all week. Why was now the moment that they fell? Well, people say that at a certain point, the Prime Minister runs out of luck. Oh. Um, <laughs> it just happens to you when everything's going wrong. Yeah. yeah. It's like the end. It's like the complete end. She's not so much as occupying the office of Prime Minister as haunting it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, again, it's difficult to make up, but the first letter is, is F, so it's an F off. <laughs> <laughs> an F off. But... They, they were magnets, weren't they? They the, were. The, the, they the were magnets. And the, the theory is that because the, the applause and the... Uh, rousing cheers was so loud that it shook the magnet off the back of... <laughs> sort of <laughs> created anti-magnetic clouds. <laughs> it's done so, it's like a vortex. Either that or there were several advisors to Theresa May, the ones she's got left behind the panel, banging their heads so hard <laughs> on the actual thing that the, that the F, as you say, fell off. Um, it wasn't long before all that was left of the, uh, of the slogan was, in fact, this. <laughs> It could have been worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, ironically, uh, oh. the Tories only switched to these smaller letters to avoid PR disasters like this. <laughs> uh, shall we do a quick before and after of the Cabinet? Here Absolutely. they are. Absolutely. Here they are, loyally, joyfully arriving, welcoming Theresa May. Here they are as the true horror of the speech. <laughs> 
dawns on them. And here. <laughs> and here. <laughs> and, and this is the audience. Look, look at this. Look. <laughs> <laughs> Fifteen percent of respondents to a YouGov poll said that the speech had gone well. 15, which is, there's no way that could just be the cabinet. 15% of people, 15 of people watched that and thought, yes, yeah, that's gone rather well. <laughs> which makes you wonder what, what it would take to lower that number from 15%. You, she could have stood there and melted like the witch at the end of The Wizard of Oz. And she said, 12% think it went rather well. <laughs> She's a puddle on the floor. 10% still, still think it's gone rather well. It's, it's 15%. Are you sure that isn't just members of the Labour Party? <laughs> 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 they say brilliantly. They say fantastically. I mean, she makes Jeremy look good as a speaker, which is, is quite something. <laughs> yes. I mean, behind all the coughing, I think she was trying to say something. Did, you, uh, <laughs> did anyone catch the substance of, uh, of the speech? She had a brilliant policy about energy caps, that is mm -hmm. um, Ed Miliband. We heard that before, yes. She had a yes. brilliant policy about housing, which is a sort of watered-down version of Jeremy Corbyn's. And there was something else that she probably nicked off um, Clement Attlee, but I couldn't make it out. <laughs> it was the, renewing the British dream. Of course, yes. the British Renew dream. Renew the British dream. We've heard British before. Dream? Oh, you? I've had it many times. Have you? <laughs> <laughs> it involves being found naked in a queue. Well, the other queue over there keeps yeah. getting shorter Move and shorter. <laughs> <laughs> And meanwhile, tuition freeze, f fees are being frozen. Tuition freeze? Tu there is which a tuition is. freeze. It is. She's freezing, freeze. which is going <laughs> to thrill the average age of 72 members of the Tory party, isn't it? That's, yes. Is that really the average age, 72? Of Tory party members, 72. No, no, yeah. that's just the young Conservatives. <laughs> <laughs> is, is she, I mean, is she done for? Is that it? Can she, can she carry Look, on? Look, there's a repeat. They're going to know. You've oh. asked a question of, of, of people who've usually got it wrong in the past. Mm. <laughs> I predicted Trump member last series, and you said, you said, stop being so pessimistic. Yep. <laughs> I'm always wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I Jacob Rees-Mogg thinks she can stay for, for quite a bit longer. Have a look at this. Yeah, he's just waiting till he's 18. <laughs> <laughs> Stay as leader. Forever and ever. Amen, amen, alleluia, alleluia, amen. For what day? Forever and ever. Eternity. Even eternity is too short to extol her. <laughs> uh, so why do people think Amber Rudd is now sort of lining herself up for leadership? What happened in her camp? Well, she's hired Linton Crosby. She has. Um, and he was behind the last... Conservative landslide. Yeah. <laughs> Minority <laughs> government. Uh, when did he last do anything right, Linton? Uh, the Crosby. London mayor, he, he managed to yeah. stop us getting Zach Goldsmith. Um, <laughs> he was working for him against Sadiq Khan. <laughs> <laughs> so that was quite good. I'm all for Crosby. They should hire him forever, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's the real scandal associated with Amber Rudd? The real Rudd scandal. It's not this traffic light joke. It is the traffic it? light joke, it is, yes. Uh, about a year ago, Paul Merton made this joke. Um, <laughs> Amber Rudd marry somebody called Green, and she'd be like a traffic light, wouldn't she be? Amber Rudd Green. <laughs> <laughs> Just occurred to me, that's all. <laughs> and then, eight months later, Labour's Alan Johnson said this. Am I the only one who thinks Amber Rudd sounds like a traffic light sequence? So... <laughs> So she stood for the Green Party, be Amber <laughs> Rudd's Green. Uh, <laughs> like the Highway Code. <laughs> I said that on the programme about eight months ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out the gag's even older than that, cos really? here is some footage from Series 1. Oh. I was uh, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> what have the Tories been doing to target the youth vote? They've got a, a conservative Instagram. Yes. Which is so bad. <laughs> and it's so incongruous because Instagram's such a forward, modern, sort of positive, fundamentally is showing. It? We sort of, look how good life is. Well, look um, how good my life is. Yeah. <laughs> you sad saps out there. <laughs> <laughs> Miserable showing off. <laughs>
<laughs> Put it away. Have you got an account? Don't be ridiculous. <laughs> I'd really like to see you have an account and just take some daily photos. <laughs> <laughs> the Conservative Instagram, they've been bringing all the excitement of the behind-the-scenes stuff at the conference. Uh, we've had things like Damien Green uh, <laughs> strikingly holding some paper by a beige wall. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Jeremy Hunt handsomely by a red door. <laughs> and uh, my favourite, this is uh, Michael Fallon relaxing backstage. <laughs> If that's not going to get the kids, I don't know what <laughs> will. <laughs> Incidentally, as part of the Youth Charm Offensive, Philip Hammond gave an interview to The Mail this week. He was asked to describe himself in one word. What do you think he said? Chillin. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's Hammond... on Boris Karloff sort of way. <laughs> oh, my God! <laughs> Hammond paused for a while and then replied, Fiscal. <laughs> There was quite a lot of Corbyn bashing going on at the, at the conference as well. Philip Hammond, Theresa May, Boris Johnson, they all attacked Labour for taking us back to the 70s. And uh, Ruth Davison uh, questioned Corbyn's confusing triumphalism, saying Corbyn hasn't even won a raffle yet. How does all... she know? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Highbury East Labour Party were quick to point out... <laughs> ..can confirm this is not true. He won at Highbury's <laughs> Christmas <laughs> raffle last December and declined to take a prize. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. uh, and of course, the Lib Dems had a conference too. Did mm. anyone, anyone see that? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Neither did I. But here is a highlight. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yes, this is the Tory party conference and Theresa May's comeback speech. <laughs> Theresa May's speech did actually include many major policy announcements, but they were all obviously overshadowed. I mean, I'm sure JFK did some other stuff in Dallas that morning. <laughs> 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 Theresa May's premiership has been under a... Th <clears throat> You're right. Yeah, I think I'm OK. <laughs> <laughs> Theresa May's premiership has been under threat for a while, but this must be the first time that the coffin itself could be the final nail. <laughs> <laughs> Paul and James, take yes. a look at this. Yes. OK, there's a, a clearly an uh, animated rocket taking off. Ah, yes, this is uh, Rocket Man. I think this is a Republic serial called Revenge of the Rocket Men. No, that's the man that Donald Trump thinks is the leader of North Korea. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Little Rocket Man. Little Rocket Man. It's about transport flying. There's it a, is, there's yes. A, a guy that claims you're going to be taking people from London to New York in half an hour, something like a space, up into space. But um, is anybody cold in here, by the way? Does it feel cold? Yes. If we could have the uh, less cold, it'd be good. Um... <laughs> oh, I was, I was enjoying chilling. <laughs> you an Instagram? Um, so yes, yeah, so this is um, uh, yeah, so he's a rocket man. So yeah, it's essentially you're going to be able to get from New York to London and back in half an hour. Although there's no reason why you wouldn't want to do it necessarily. But it's one of those stories. It's in five years' time. It's going to happen in five mm. years' time. It's always in five years' time. I do, apart from this occasion, where it's seven years' time. Oh, seven right? years' time. Within, this is Elon Musk. He's the billionaire inventor. Elon Musk. Elon Musk. That's what I'm wearing at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and it's his new space rocket travel service, operational, he reckons, within seven years. Yes. Do you know what the rocket is called? Big effing rocket. BFR. BFR which stands yes. literally for the big fucking rocket. I... <laughs> <laughs> How big's the milk bottle it's going into? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is it actually what he called it? Yes. Yes, yeah, the BFR. So it's not the big friendly rocket. <laughs> <laughs> you mustn't go on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> You're not ready, Ian. <laughs> um... Look, this is how it's going to work. <laughs> it's amazing how every it's country really looks evil. like North Korea when it's got that <laughs> diagram. <laughs> um, but what are Elon Musk's plans for this rocket? He said he wants humans, he wants us to be a, a, a multi-planet species. Yes. So he wants us, he wants to set up sort of stuff in Mars. He basically knows how to get us there, but he doesn't know how to sort of keep us alive. How did he suggest Mars might be warmed up quickly? Pull it nearer to the sun. <laughs> <laughs> Explode a thermonuclear device at each pole. He's a Bond villain. He's <laughs> <laughs> even got the name. It's yeah. ridiculous. We're falling for it. It'll be too late when we're colonising the moon. His evil plan yeah. will have come to fruition. Uh, but, but even before the Mars thing, it's getting around the globe. Yes. He thinks we could uh, pop to Australia for the day. 
Which is good, because the only thing that stopped me going till now is the thought of not being back in time for Neighbours. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it bodes well for our planet for us to have a plan B. Do you know what I mean? Like, we're not going to save... I don't think we put enough effort into saving our planet if we know we've got a backup. A bit like trying yeah. to save a marriage whilst going on Tinder. I don't think yeah. we should have <laughs> any, any sort of place that else to work, go. That not work, then. <laughs> <laughs> and who, how bad would Earth have to be for us to want to live on to Mars? To go to Australia? <laughs> 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 but, I mean, the G-force alone would, would probably kill most people. Yes. That's interesting. <laughs> well, that's because he's got other ideas. There's the Hyperloop. This is a network of tubes around the globe that can fire people from one place to another in seconds. I mean, I'm into this guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he sounded crazy, but I like it. <laughs> and he's building something absolutely remarkable right now. What, do you know what he's building, which I think is brilliant. This could be fantastic. Yes. Do you know what, what is it is? It? It's the world's biggest battery. BFB. There we are. <laughs> <laughs> What's the battery going to be powering? The little windmill? It's right? No, it's, this is... It's a... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a 100 That's megawatt... That's our entire energy policy in a picture. <laughs> it's a 100 megawatt wind-charged battery that will power South Australia indefinitely. Or an iPhone for, for a couple of days. <laughs> Elon Musk, interesting man, he has a two-pizza rule. Do you know what the two-pizza rule of Elon Musk is? No, but I'm... Even liking him more. Yeah. <laughs> he said, if there's a meeting that can't be fed with two pizzas, there are too many people in it. Oh, nothing worse than a tight billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> which, which travel company won't be providing much competition for the, the BFR? Mm -hmm. Monarch Airlines. Yes, yeah, right, absolutely right, yes. Because they, they went bust. Why? Why they went they bust? They ran out of planes. Yeah. The exchange oh, rate did for them. But yeah. they did go to a lot of places that people don't really want to go to anymore. This is true. Sharm el Sheikh is not It's, such it's a not a big, big draw now, is it? No. Which airline has had a record number of bookings this year? Ryanair? Yes. God. Ryanair. Too many bookings. Despite all the cancellations due mm. to shortage of pilots, mm. Monarch have a few spare, uh, <laughs> Ryanair's bookings increased by a million in September. Wow. Yeah. That's an amazing thought, isn't it? Yeah. Cheap flights, I suppose. No frills. No frills. No, no pilot. Yeah. <laughs> during, during the mass cancellation, <laughs> what did Ryanair offer some of its passengers by way of compensation? Punch in the face. I, was <laughs> I think I would take that over what they offer. A replacement bus service. <laughs> For That's not going to get you flights. Australia in a day. <laughs> <laughs> this is the news that billionaire Elon Musk is planning to build a rocket known as a BFR, or Big Fucking Rocket. <laughs> According to the Daily Mail, the BFR would make it feasible to pop to Australia inside an hour, which could be good news for England's cricket team, as Ben Stokes might be able to play for them on day release. <laughs> <laughs> It's been a turbulent week for air travel. Monarch went bust and hundreds of thousands of Ryanair passengers faced hours of queuing and misery as their flights went ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and so to round two, the picture spin quiz. Fingers on buzzers, teams. Oh. Paul and James. Oh, no, what's his name? Bentham. Jeremy Bentham. He's the guy that sort of... Is it University College of London? That's uh, right. He died sometime in the 19th century, and it was in his will that he had to attend um, all sort of <laughs> meetings of a particular council meeting, whatever, and so they put him in the room, and he's, al he's allowed to vote, or he sits there or something. <laughs> he sits there. <laughs> he sits there, and they all have to sing, Oh, Jeremy Bentham. <laughs> <laughs> This is the news that the mummified head of 19th century philosopher Jeremy Bentham mm -hmm. will actually go on display for the first time in decades. According yes. to the Telegraph, Bentham insisted his body be preserved after death so it could be wheeled out at parties <laughs> if his friends were missing him. <laughs> um, why did his head get separated from his... Uh, well, probably sort of deteriorated was it a bit? De decomposing at a different rate or something? There was a mummification mistake. His head oh. was deemed too distasteful for the general public and mm. uh, it was Can removed. It? I mean, how bad can it be? Come on, let's have a look. It's, um... 15% oh. of Conservative voters polled said the mummification had gone really well. <laughs> <laughs> it's got the expression that women use when they're putting on lipstick. <laughs> <laughs> they're not real eyes, are they? No. No! no. <laughs> <laughs> UCL did try to minimise the impact when the head was first put on show. Uh, this is how it used to be displayed. That yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Absolutely fine. Nothing wrong. Nothing wrong. Where are we going? No. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, elsewhere in the news, what other thing that some people find quite repulsive <laughs> might be going on display in a museum soon? That big old thing yes. in the sewer yes. made of yes. fat wet wipes. Fat What's it called? Oh, the Fatberg. 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 Yeah. Oh, I exactly see right. That. Yes, here it is. <laughs> the Great London <laughs> Fatberg. Absolutely. Oh. 250 <laughs> metres long, 130 tonne mass of congealed fat, wet wipes, nappies and condoms found blocking a sewer earlier this month, which the Museum of London are interested in putting on exhibition. Oh, come on. If what it do doesn't win the Turner Prize first. Put... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they kept saying it weighs the same amount as ten double-decker buses. I love it when they weigh things in things. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> but it should be more than buses, like a thousand hair dryers full of squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> 85,000 egg cups. Yeah. <laughs> it's very um, hard. So it's yeah. incredibly difficult to move that. I thought it was some, you know, huge... Sludge. Sludgy, slimy mm. thing that would come and get you, you know, Doctor mm. Who 1970, and it would sort of come mm. out the tube. <laughs> oh, no, it's the Fatberg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Fatberg! <laughs> I shall block your arteries. <laughs> <laughs> this is the mummified head of the philosopher Jeremy Bentham. Where, is. where is it? <laughs> <laughs> so you're not wearing it now, are you? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> is he wearing it now? According to the Telegraph, once a year the head is examined to check the hair and skin aren't falling off. Jerry Hall has to do the same thing with Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> <laughs> Also this week, it was revealed that part of a fatberg may go on display at the Museum of London. The task of removing the fatberg is now underway. Even as we speak, workers are down in the dank sewer, firing a jet hose at the congealed mass of stinking fat, <laughs> excrement and used condoms, all of them thinking, it could be worse, I could be Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> OK, fingers on buzzers, teams. <laughs> Yes, Paul and James. Ah, this is the uh, interview in Saga magazine. Yes. Claire Baldin gave, um, and the journalist who interviewed her complained afterwards that um, Claire Baldin was allowed to put in her own quotes after the piece had been written. That's right. Quite harsh, though, some of the questions. Do you ever put sugar in your ear to attract horses? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, she did an interview with Ginny, Drew Griffiths Saga magazine, who then claimed the star had, had the interview edited to make more of how lovely she was. Mm. How mm. did Dougary react to her interview being changed? She was very cross. She was cross. She gave interviews, didn't she? <laughs> she did. Yeah. She wrote in The Observer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, she accused Balding of being an insecure diva, saying her behaviour was unsisterly and undermining of a fellow woman professional, erodes the integrity of our public print, <laughs> and claimed she couldn't say Balding was lovely, as she found her quite a brisk, jolly hockey sticks type. And that's how I wrote her. Do you, think, I mean, do you think it was Claire Balding who changed the copy? Well, she didn't have copy approval. She said she didn't have copy approval. So it was the editor. So yeah, if you, you don't have copy approval, you don't, right? Mm. Or PR. No? I don't know. I think a lot of celeb PR is sort of a bit of a grey area. Right. It's, and it was, it was her PR that changed the copy. Right. Yeah. But um, the editor, it's the editor's responsibility, though, to say yes or no, right? It is, uh, absolutely. And there's no tougher and responsibility <laughs> in the <laughs> <laughs> Ginny Dugary would know that. I mean, the it was PRs a are PR. onto me night and day. <laughs> <laughs> Put me on the cover. I'm just chilling. How did Claire Balding respond to this? She denied it, of course. She did. Yeah. And she said she wouldn't. She said, I would never ask someone to call me lovely, gorgeous, maybe. That's exactly right. I mean, Ginny Dugary <laughs> interviewed me once. I didn't come out very well. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there's a small number of interviewers whose, whose insights and opinion of the person they're interviewing are as interesting as what the interviewee mm. actually says. And she's yeah. very much in that camp. So mm -hmm. it looks oh, like I an see. overreaction from the outside. But I think from the inside, it's, it's hang on, this is, this is what I do. But do you think if you're, if you're taking the saga dollar, if you're writing a saga interview, do you think that's maybe a... I don't, I don't want to close down any future income streams. <laughs> 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 so it's bad to give interviewees copy approval. I mean, that's, that's something... It's not really... It's not the done thing. Well, I mean, there's, the only thing when... Why are you looking at me? There's no know, earthly just way you know that I have done this once in my career. <laughs> As a very young, young journalist, I gave copy approval to David Beckham because it was the only way I was going to get the interview. And how much of it was changed? The it whole ch thing? It changed one line, and it's actually quite poignant. It, it, it was very, very young. It was while well, Victoria was pregnant with their first child, and he said that he loves her and, and the baby that's on the way more than he loves Manchester United. And he asked me to take... I've just ruined it now, haven't I? He asked me to take that out because some Manchester United fans might react quite angrily on the streets of Manchester, and I agreed. <laughs>
for saying you prefer your wife and child to your football team. Well, yeah. yes. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> it is a mystery, this game, to me. <laughs> I would have been cross if David Beckham's people had come back and said, we've inserted two paragraphs about his view on, you know, quantitative easing. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and the utilitarian principles espoused by Jeremy Bentham before he got mummified. Then I would have been a little bit... Well, hang on a minute. That, yeah. that didn't been a great happen. read, though. Yeah, of course it is. <laughs> this has taken a turn. <laughs> Uh, what, what has Marcel Proust got to do with all this? Uh, because he wrote a review of his own book. He did. <laughs> saying yeah. he was lovely. He wrote, <laughs> pieces, he wrote pieces about all his novels. This wasn't on Amazon, was it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I really love that, though. How did, he, uh, how, did, how did he describe his novel, The Remembrance of Things Past? What did he um, say? I couldn't have written brilliant. it better than myself. <laughs> 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 he compared himself... <laughs> <laughs> compared himself to Charles Dickens. What did he write about his book, his book Swan's Way? Yeah. What Mr Proust sees, feels, is of complete originality. This book almost suggests the fourth dimensions of the cubists. <laughs> it's almost too luminous for the eye. <laughs> he must have it on a Kindle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Claire Balding has been accused of acting like a diva over a magazine article. People use different means to influence what journalists say about them. Some demand copy approval. Others get their followers to go online and threaten Laura Koonsberg. <laughs> <laughs> this is serious, though. If saga readers start to doubt the integrity of the interviews in the magazine, they may start to question more fundamental truths, such as whether Rob Brydon really does spend all his time on cruises having dinner with the captain. <laughs> time now for the odd one out round. Your four are mm. African Wild Dogs, <clears throat> yes. Billy Gilbert, Thomas Edison and the James Bond theme. James Bond theme. OK, so the clue here, I think, is Billy Gilbert. He, I, he's known for two things, appearing in Laurel and Hardy films and also being the voice of Sneezy yes. in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. So it's about sneezing, it, it is. must be, because I also remember about uh, a couple of weeks ago, the Arctic dogs, uh, the uh, African, African dogs. dogs, they communicate in a pack by sneezing to each other when they decide to make a decision, where are we going to eat tonight? <laughs> and they sort of sneeze and they decide to go that way. So it's about sneezing. It is. Uh, Edison invented so many things, so he must have invented an anti-sneezing thing, which was essentially putting two small bulldozers up your nose or something. <laughs> and there's somebody who's allergic to the James Bond theme, and every time they hear it, they sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> did, it, it, it's oh, definitely sneezing. I mean, you're, you're most of the way there. Did Edison record himself sneezing? Edison actually filmed. Oh, the, Fred uh, Ott sneeze. Exactly, Fred Ott sneeze. Fred Ott sneeze. The first motion picture. <laughs> Just about, yeah. Here it is. Have a look. This is when films are five seconds long. It is exactly five seconds long. There we are. That's Fred Ott. <laughs> you you have to slow snuff. that down just to that get it brilliant. there. I can't wait for the sequel. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Theresa May's speech at the Conservative. <laughs> um, but let's go back to Billy Gilbert, because, mm. as you say, Billy Gilbert's comedy routine was all about sneezing. Yes, he's the voice of Sneezy the Dwarf, uh, one it... of the dwarfs in Snow White and some dwarfs. That's right, here he is deploying his famous sneeze. He's got sneeze. a nice pair of legs, though, isn't he? Yeah, <laughs> uh, In 1931, this is in the... <laughs> <laughs> Those are tan stockings, though, tan stockings. That's what's going on there. Uh, here he is in the 1931 murder mystery, Chinatown After Dark. I came here with my brother. He had an appointment here. Yeah? You can't... You can't... You can't... You can't... <laughs> what was the secret of a comedy sneeze, according to Billy Gilbert? Oh, uh, as he probably did, they extended out a bit. Uh, 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 do a bit of that beforehand. Pre a... Predict where the sneeze is going to be and then go exactly for the sneeze. exactly right. He, he said he never actually practised the sneeze, saying anyone can sneeze. The secret is to keep them guessing when it will come. <laughs> BBC, BBC newsreader Sean Lay certainly seems to have mastered this. Joining me now is Thin Thin Hilan, Oxfam Country Director in Sierra Leone. Thin Thin, thank you for breaking <laughs> off from your very busy work to talk to us uh, today. What's the latest? Excuse me. What's the latest situation now? <laughs> oh. oh, very good. So, yes, what's the Bond sneeze connection? Well, I don't know, unless there's a villain that gave him away by sneeze, and I can't, I can't think... The what... theme, the Bond... The, James the, Bond the, theme. the original theme, the Monty Norman... The, the Monty Norman, exactly. There the, was a song there was before a song, that, that exactly had right. that... The dee, 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 that bit. Called mm -hmm. Good Sign, Bad Sign. It was about an Indian man with a magic sneeze. Ah. In fact, we can, we, we, we can listen to it. OK. It's a great song. Yeah. I was born with this unlucky sneeze and what is worse I came into the world the wrong way and it's all agreed that I'm the reason why my father fell into the village pond and drowned Now would this be you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
Bond should have kept that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would you right. like a tissue, Mr. Bond? <laughs> uh, yeah, Edison's the only one out because he didn't sneeze. It was Fred no. on sneeze. No, the Bond theme is the odd one out. No. <laughs> the African Wild Dogs got one out because it uses a sneeze to sort of make its arrangements for dinner. No. The, uh, it's Billy, Billy Gilbert. Gilbert. <laughs> yes, they have all been influenced by sneezing, apart from Billy Gilbert, whose famous sneeze routine landed him the part of Sneezy in Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, uh, which led to a fair amount of professional envy from his stage partner, Bob Farty Sullivan. <laughs> <laughs> Time now for the Missing Words round, which this week features as its guest <laughs> publication, the Pembrokeshire Fungus Recorder. <laughs> And we start with... The highlight of UK Fungus Day for many was what? Going home. <laughs> <laughs> was it the deadly nightshade tasting stall? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, of course, the discovery of the Phallus Hadrianae or Dune Stinkhorn. Ah. UK Fungus Day 2017 is actually this Sunday. Mm. Sensible move, as in previous years when it's been held on a weekday, absences from work are estimated to have cost the British economy up to £6. <laughs> <laughs> Next, the bacterial slime oozing from Ray Wilkinson's elm tree. What? Seek similar. <laughs> <laughs> Is a fantastic foreign secretary on the top of his game, says Michael <laughs> Had become colonised by yeast and developed a strong smell. Congratulations, Mr Wilkinson, you've struck Marmite. <laughs> uh, next, outrage as Sainsbury's launches taste the difference what? Shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Is it the cannibal range? <laughs> taste the difference. Taste the difference. <laughs> Edible gold. Caviar. Oh. Edible gold. Oh, you gold. said you said... <laughs> 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 said the answer. <laughs> He's trying to help. <laughs> <laughs> the gold is, uh, is to go on top of your steak. You don't even buy any what? vegetables. It comes with 24 carrots. Um, <laughs> next, farmer wows audience by what? Rotating crops. <laughs> <laughs> Is it paying back subsidy? <laughs> <laughs> farmer wows audience by playing vegetable flute. <laughs> this is a farmer in China, and, <laughs> uh, and here he is. Oh, that's that's nice. Nice. Yeah. And if you're not 100% convinced by the authenticity of that, here he is getting a tune out of a tube of toothpaste. That's just whistling. That's just true. <laughs> the tube of toothpaste doesn't need to be there. <laughs> Next, five years on from the launch of the best-selling volume, Fascinated by Fungi, Pat O'Reilly, what? Launches Fascinated by Fungi 2. Is exactly right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, next, now you can what with your pet cat? Dance, sing, <laughs> play the piano. P. P. <laughs> cats can pee in toilets. You can train cats to pee in toilets now. What? Not that you do it together. <laughs> no, <I'm gonna> say. <laughs> now you can change the TV channel oh. with your pet cat. It hey. even has four pause buttons. <laughs> Is it real or just a pun? I don't know if you train the cat to go over to the telly and press... I don't have buttons anymore. Really. No, you don't no, go no, over to no, the telly. No. Well, you send the butler to do that, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> do it yourself. You get me Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> Next, as a reward for keeping his dung moist, Mike Crutchley... <laughs> He's having a roof put on his outside lavatory. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Crutchley found a collection of cushion-shaped fruit bodies with spore sacs, each containing 32 spores. Now, if any of us had got that, that would have been quite remarkable, <laughs> wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> now, we would show you a photo of it, but uh, Mike Crutchley has copyrighted it. Oh, what the hell? £24.50. Let's go for it. Come on, let's have a look. Have a look. <laughs> there we go. That was a waste of £24, isn't <laughs> <Yeah>. it? <laughs> and finally, Only Fools and Horses star met Adolf Hitler and what? Is it Ken Livingston? <laughs> <laughs> and regrets not killing him. 
Leonard Pierce, who played Grandad in Only Fools and Horses, met Hitler after a play in the 1930s. The actor claims he did have a plan to kill the Fuhrer, but Rodney undid the wrong chandelier. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the final scores are Ian and Roisin on four, but Paul and James winning this week with five. <laughs> but before we go, there's just time for the captain competition. Ian and Roisin have this. Uh, oh, God. It's the new Kardashian Lilo range. <laughs> <laughs> Paul and James get that. Uh, this bird walks into a bar <laughs> <laughs> and he says to the landlord, I'll have a vodka, please. And the landlord says, Grey Goose, it's only on my father's side. <laughs> <laughs> and I leave you with news that at the Benelin factory, there's evidence Theresa May's cough medicine may have been tampered with. <laughs> There's a surprise for one man as he uses Lynx aftershave for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> and on a nostalgic reunion for the cast of Summer Holiday, Cliff Richard accidentally turns left into Crimea. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. And if you fancy more satire when it comes to the news and world events, over on BBC iPlayer you can catch up with Mock the Week, combining panel shows, stand-up and games with two teams of comedians, all available now. Sill his head and sing that again. Tomorrow. They are. <laughs> I'll do it with anyone now. Oh, Ian. <laughs> 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 <laughs>